Mr. Danto, let's do it. You were raving about this when we started, Seth, right? I'm telling you that, so I would say aside from the first two podcasts, which were the Plato and the Descartes, the Plato because of the subject matter and because it kind of kicked everything off and Descartes because of my love and passion for Descartes. This reading is why I'm happy to do this and why I'm enjoying it. It was a complete revelation and surprise. It came about, as you mentioned, through Jessica. So it kind of was one of these, it wasn't just kind of a stumble upon, it was a result of reinvigorating a social relationship and reconnecting with old colleagues and getting us into a modern thinker who I could respect instead of despise. And it's beautifully written, I think. Wes made the point earlier, he's a very, very good writer. And it's about philosophy. It's not about aesthetics. I thought we were going to have a podcast on aesthetics. You know, what is art? What is the meaning of art? That sort of thing. And instead, what we have is a legitimate philosophical discussion that I think is extremely interesting and very well put and fascinating. So I'm excited to talk about it. Yep. And it was hard to come up even with, you know, a single question to encapsulate because this is three different essays uh, in a book that has some common theme throughout it. But, you know, he does address some different issues. Really, his viewpoint was highly affected by the avant-garde. So he was a critic in the 60s when you know Warhol and Jasper Johns, he talks a lot about, and uh, Robert Rauschenberg. These were all people who were influenced by Marcel Duchamp again. He was really influenced by what the showing of these people's works did to the art world itself. So just as, a, as an example, should we talk a little bit about like the ready-mades and stuff? Sure. So some of this I got from, I have a secondary source that I'll also provide a link to. This was actually something, I read some essay by Danto, I don't even remember which one in the aesthetics class I took in undergrad. And then we also read part of a book called The Bride and the Bachelors, which was written in the 60s, Five Masters of the Avant-Garde. So it's these like 50 to 100 page biographical, but also sort of philosophical analyses of Duchamp, John Cage, a musician, Rauschenberg again, and also like a sculptor and a dancer, and uh, kind of say, says a lot about what those people thought that they were doing. And to some degree, they were all trying to get past the distinction between art and life. And the uh, senior of these was Marcel Duchamp, because he did most of his work like in the 20s, you know, pretty early. He would do things like these ready-mades, which are, he would go buy a urinal at a plumbing supply store. And he submitted it to this museum showing, specifically because I think the museum had said, we're not going to be judgmental about what you guys are doing. We're just going to post everything. So he's like kind of challenging that. So he submitted the urinal as is. He like signed a name on it. It wasn't even his name and submitted that and called it Fountain, <laughs> which seems like it's just a joke. But then he went on to do this a bunch more times. So he has like hat rack and comb. So he calls these ready-mades at these things. And... Danto actually takes this really seriously as because, it, you know, it ended up, though, in that particular case with the first one, first of all, they, they just rejected it and said, this is not art at all. It's not that we think it's bad art. It's just not art at all. But eventually these things did get displayed and they're part of, you know, the thing that Duchamp is most remembered for, in fact. And so it was the fact that he was doing it. And so there's a lot of interpretations of what, how is this art? Like it's conceptual art. It's not the thing itself. It's not like he went and built it with his own two hands and you can admire his handiwork. I mean, you could say, Oh, you know, what a beautiful urinal this is. But, uh, Danto argues against that really like Duchamp was trying to pick things that were aesthetically neutral. And in fact, he was challenging this whole notion that art is about beauty. Art is something more than that. So the question Danto gets out of this is, if you accept that this is an artwork, it looks exactly like a regular urinal. <laughs> it's just one of them is posted in a museum and is called art, and one of them is not. So what is it that makes one art and one not art? Is it really just the being in the museum? Or could you have, you know, somebody accidentally left there? You know, another one is a snow shovel. So maybe the guys who are, sh who are shoveling the snow outside the museum, you know, went in and left their shovels against the wall. Like, well, those wouldn't suddenly become exhibits because they were in the museum. So there must be something else. And so that's the question he's starting with. The snow shovel has the witty title in advance of a broken arm. Yes. Do you find that a challenge to your notion of arts or is it just kind of a stupid conceptual joke that makes some point, but is nothing too profound? Stupid conceptual joke. <laughs> Let's throw that out there, Seth. <laughs> Give a more nuanced view. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have always had problems with 20th century art and understanding it. And I took a, a class in college that was about art that focused on the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And so I think my conception of what art was and, and the value of art was very much wrapped up in that. And I got very caught up in the ideas of viewing artworks in their political context and their social context and their economic context, you know, sort of like there's lots of different ways to do art history, just like there's historiography, lots of different ways to do history where you look at the material conditions that produce the art, you look at the social conditions around the artist and so forth. And 20th century art, I never really understood it and it never really appealed to me. And it wasn't actually until I just read this book that I had any sense of why that was a problem for me. You're including that not just this wacky postmodern stuff that we're talking about, but modern art itself, Picasso and those guys. I'd say yes, although with increasingly difficult, increasingly more degree as you get through the 20th century. So, for example, there's Picasso and Matisse and Klimt and guys that I can appreciate, or at least I have my own standard and my own way of judging and appreciating. But when you talk about Kandinsky and Miro and Pollock, the more abstract it gets, the less I was able to get a hold of it. And I didn't really know, I didn't really understand why. And now I have a, what I would say is a much better understanding of why that were so difficult for me and why I didn't have a grip on it. By the way, that little bit in the article about Guernica that he leads mm -hmm. off of and the disenfranchisement mm -hmm. of art is just absolutely fascinating. Tell us a little about that. I think he's trying to make the point about what art means in context to the artist and to people who view the artwork will change over time. So he's trying to make a point about Guernica or Guernica was made by Picasso, and it was intended to illustrate an act of terrorism or violence uh, about this village. And Danto's claim is that anybody who lived at that time, who saw the artwork, would have recognized that what it was was a kind of protest, or at least a statement about the violence of, I guess it was the Germans against this Spanish villager. And he quotes Picasso responding to a German saying something to that effect. But he says, you know, to an audience, even 20 or 30 years later, the historical context of what happened at that village and how this was a representation of that village is completely lost. It's completely gone. And if you don't know that this was originally intended to point out this atrocity that happened here, then how does the artwork have meaning to you? And what does it mean? He was trying to make a point about context and, and so forth. Yep. I just want to quote the German line thing because it's really, really funny. Picasso responded to the German officer's question, having handed him a postcard of the painting. Did you do that? And then Picasso responds, no, you did. <laughs> so, right. I thought that was great. You know, it reminds me of um, my own experiences with museums where I have to admit I, I have a sort of uh, problem. Visual arts for me aren't as powerful as, as say, literature. I, I guess I'm more into diegesis than the mesis. Right. We're going to have to watch that going through this, that the visual art is his uh, paradigm yeah. case. But you know, there's, right. there's supposed to be a story here about art in general. Right. And he moves beyond. I have a theory, by the way, about that. He'll move, he, he moves beyond um, the visual arts. And I think within this book, right, he moves on yep. to literature. And last year being in Italy, I, I, I'm trying to say I need the historical context. Now, I, I have to admit, when I was in, uh, say, Venice, my favorite parts were like the armory and the dungeons and the... What? Doges. So I'm a, I'm really a philistine in a way, and I <laughs> it, it, when it comes to the visual art, I'm like that typical American that William James writes about, who just sort of glances blankly. At the, not not entirely. I'm doing myself a little discredit, but I, I I'm trying to say is I need the handheld audio thing, or I need to be able to look at some description, and then I can appreciate it, or I need to be, bring the story of art or some short history. Otherwise, it's difficult for me to appreciate, and it's certainly difficult for me to go in and and look at uh, 14th century iconic stuff of the Virgin Mary and, and appreciate it at all. Because I am not a Christian, and I think even Christians today, because they're not Christians in the way that, they're not that say, a Christian. 14th century Italian was... Is it any longer a work of art to them? It certainly is not going to have the same power. It's certainly not going to be the communication, let's say, that it was at the time it was done. So we, I feel like we should start with his central philosophical thesis, 
that he lays out in the disenfranchisement of art, because I think that's really the central point to all of the stuff that we're going to talk about. All right, let's hear it. Go ahead. So <laughs> what's the thesis? Danto's claim is that philosophy has disenfranchised art in the following way, beginning with Plato, that Plato is ultimately responsible for this and that really everything, you know, in the last 2,500 years or whatever is just a echoing of Plato. But basically what the, the net is that Plato says that the purpose of art is to represent things, to mimic or represent the image of something, and that where philosophy is responsible for trying to get at things themselves, mm -hmm. art, by virtue of just focusing on the representation or the image of something, is sort of one step removed from that. So art is just by definition less central and less useful than philosophy because it's one step removed from the object. And in general, art has no utility because you can't do anything with art. It doesn't serve any purpose. Uh, a work of art doesn't shoe a horse or create a building or define a political... People. That's all, all it can do is fool people. All it can do is fool people. You'd say, look at all these grapes I have here. Oh, that's just a picture of grapes. Ah, you bastard. That's, that's right. That's all you can do. So the term... But it means, also can corrupt them. Well, yes, it's dangerous, even though it's completely impotent, which is the central paradox that Danto brings up. But his key point is that the definition of art from a philosophical perspective from way back when, all the way through Kant, everybody uses the same definition, is that it is mimetic, which means to say that it tries to mimic or represent reality, and it does so poorly, at least at the beginning. And so his philosophy of the history of art is that the history of art is the history of getting successively better and better and better at representing. Well, and for Plato, it was especially bad because the objects of our experience are themselves pale imitations of the real things, the true yes. forms of the world. But you don't have to be, you know, a Platonist to still feel like art is epiphenomenal, right? It sits on the surface of things. It has no causal power. It has no, uh, again, no utility. It's just, just a surface level phenomenon. Yes. And if a huge part in modern times, if a huge part of philosophy is trying to get through perception or sensory data to the things themselves or to actual objects or to monads or whatever, then art is even doubly useless because it's just creating a barrier between you and even your sense perceptions. Which, just to bring attention to something that's not visual arts, I was brought to mind when I read in high school, I read Brave New World, and this was like the paradigm case of a philosophical novel. And I really saw it as just poorly written philosophy. Like, if you just <laughs> throw away the art part of it and just tell me your philosophical thesis, then I would be able to evaluate it much more easily and actually discard it, I thought at the time, that, you know, that putting it in this story form and dressing it up, like, could only serve to obscure the truths, the alleged truths contained therein. I, I actually like that novel. I was a high school bastard. That's all I'm saying. There's a, <laughs> I mean, there, I understand your argument. It's sort of like the Ayn Rand effect where you have some thesis and you, you know, you hit it too hard in the, in the fiction, the message overwhelms the aesthetic, let's say. But I think, you know, what is, speaking of message and the aesthetic, is he rejecting the idea that art is impotent in the end? He only alludes to, at the end of the essay, to his um, transfiguration of the commonplace, which I wish I had started reading earlier so I could jump in and read some of that. But the structure of artworks, and this is on page 21 of the book, is of a piece with the structure of rhetoric. And that is, it is the office of rhetoric to modify the minds and then the actions of men and women by co-opting their feelings. Let Oops. me just clarify. So The Transfiguration of the Commonplace was the book that he wrote before this one. In the beginning of the third essay that we read, The Appreciation and Interpretation of Works of Art, he says, this essay here that I'm about to write is the update of The Transfiguration of the Commonplace. In fact, you should read this instead of The Transfiguration of the Commonplace. Again, what The Transfiguration is, is like the snow shovels or the urinal, that this is a commonplace object and somehow we can interpreted aesthetically or presented aesthetically or something and it is transformed into a work of art. 